you're a big fan of regular show and adventure time and all that. So how do you feel about all that that brings kind of like a revival of you know what Rocco had brought to the table in the 90s is kind of like that parents watch with their kids or teens watch or whoever may watch it's kind of one of those things where everybody can sit around i'm not saying maybe not the whole family like you know toddler to grandma but there are those shows where whether on a major level like you know up to the simpsons but then there's you know the kind of the kid channel stuff but with a wink to the adults i mean it's got to be nice to see because i think they personally handle it well and it's a lot of like adult laughter yeah. you'll find well and you know i i think uh it was very difficult to limit animation to just kids and uh there was a while there in the 80s 70s and that they were thinking that the only people who wanted to watch animation were kids so when the early 90s came around we started doing stuff and when stimpy came around and rocco and Simpsons and you know they really started seeing that there's it's it's really universal and it's appeal and uh, you know I mean the original Looney Tunes were aimed at adults not not at kids and so it was just picking up where those left off and and yeah JG was uh, JG Quintella of the radio show was uh, I hired him from Cal Arts to work on my show Camp Lazo and and he definitely had that sensibility that we were looking for on uh, Lazo as well. And then he went and did the regular show, which is great. You know, let's give you this show and see what you can do with it. And then it's, you know, some look at it as cult status, even though it's like, you know, big on Cartoon Network and carrying right now what's going on, especially the animation. I've heard people say it's like, you know, 70s style animation, when even though you notice on Cartoon Network, like, a very similar style with other shows, but with regular show, you know, it's kind of like different in a good way, a little awkward, but in a good way, it's, you know, nice to look at. It's scenic. Yeah, no, it, it, it hits, it's, it hits a nerve. I think anytime that, uh, you know, the, the one thing about the environment right now, and especially with the, uh, you know, Netflix coming in and Amazon coming in is that there's a lot of cartoon creators who are able to to uh, flex their muscle and, and show what they can do. And there's lots of different takes on lots of different uh, genres of cartoons. And, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot available out there for them, a lot of distribution points. And, you know, JG's just one of them. And, and uh, Adventure Time was, you know, broke through. And, uh, you know, they don't all break through, but they, but at least they're given a shot, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they all have something to say, which is important. So, and, and, you know, that's the thing is that there were, there was really Nickelodeon really paved the way at the beginning before Cartoon Network to, to say to a creator, here's your show, do what you want to do. I, I mean, I was an independent filmmaker and, and, uh, Linda Siminski at you know Nickelodeon saw my films and said, "Do you want to try doing this on TV and just basically move your independent film type work into a television realm?" Which I thought was ridiculous, but you know they they seem serious about trying it out, and so that's basically what it what it comes down to in in regards to vision. You know, it's not it's not a corporate vision anymore. It's not a huge monstrosity of committees uh, making cartoons it's individual visions and yeah that was really the start of it i really can appreciate a lot of this like diy kind of value right now because everything from netflix to crowdfunding i mean even youtube helped blow up a lot of things because you see people releasing their original content and it gets noticed it gets eyes opened people might get you know, an opportunity or a deal out of it. And these are things where in the 90s, it was in an infancy related just to, you know, World Wide Web, AOL, all that stuff. And it's just, this is what we're given and this is what we're going to do with it. And this is how others will respond to it. I I did a book uh, a few years back uh, called Creating uh, Animated uh, Cartoons 
creating animated characters for animation. And we, it basically talks about being able to, to take your vision and put it into some sort of series. And we do cover, uh, you know, the web as, as well as making something for, for a, a network channel or whatnot. And, and it really is. Uh, and I basically did that because there were a lot of people who were constantly writing to me saying, I want to do my own show and how do you do it? And how, how's it done? And it's, and, and it's basically because, and that was a time when the web was really cracking open with a lot of opportunities for people to do their own thing. And, and, um, so it's basically about character development and trying to, to make something that will work in the long run and, and having uh, stories that, that uh, can, can be continually you know, derived from the characters that you create. And, and anybody can, who's got a vision, I'm not saying that everything out there is, is good stuff. <laughs> it's not. But, um, but they're given a shot. You know, anybody who's got the drive to do it. Uh, and the good stuff breaks through and starts attracting audience, and you know, and it, uh, and more than once I've heard people recently at these uh, these content uh, conferences where you know, networks are buying content is is that it's a creators it's a creators market right now that uh, there's a lot available to there's a lot of airtime uh, being offered up. You know, so it's really a good time to if you if you have that uh, kind of drive to to do something like that and the creativity to do it. Definitely, and I recall there was like a major animated film that was exclusive to Netflix released a year or two ago. I'm not sure which it was called. But there was something that stuck out to me that they got some major names on board with it. It may have been like not necessarily CGI, but mixing around with a couple things. And it's like, you know, giving them that opportunity. And we look at the Netflix, Hulu, so many outlets that it's not just limited to, you know, sitting around TV at eight o'clock Sunday night. And you got to embrace people with their schedules and trying to watch something at their convenience. That's where the whole, you know, binge watching comes from, come home from a late night of work. And then, you know, you just want to watch it on your own time. Right. Yeah, there's definitely different viewing habits. It's not so much appointment viewing is what they used to call it. You know, you'd sit down on a Sunday morning and and watch your favorite Nicktoons and stuff. It's uh, the binge watching, yeah, where they can take in five seasons worth of a show within a, a week, you know, if you really worked at it. But yeah, Netflix, you know, uh, they've got money. And Amazon has money. And they, they want to be players. And you know, if you got the money, you've got you've got the wherewithal to do it. And there's a lot of people who can do do the work. You know, uh, so yeah, more power to them if they want to. I'm not sure what the deals are. I, I've heard rumors about what some of the deals are. Um, that, but that's a whole other conversation. You know, uh, in in regard to um, you know what what people are willing to sell their ideas for and. Uh, you know, there's a whole new thing and in, in back in, in broadcast, you know, there was a syndication market, uh, but now everything gets uh, satellited all around the world. And, uh, you know, so there's all sorts of new, new ways of distribution that don't always uh, pay the, the creator of the show. But, um, you know, there's lots of different deals out there. When you bring this up, it makes me curious as to how in the 90s, the Nicktoons airing schedule ran because it's not necessarily like, you know, eight o'clock Sunday night, like the Simpsons, but did they always have a consistent, you know, day of the week and time or did it switch? Like, you know, sometimes with a show, they'll try this time on this day and then a year or two next season, whatever, they'll try something different or was it just consistent the whole run? No, it was, uh, we moved around time slots a little bit. It started out, uh, I think it was Doug, Rugrats, Rin and Stimpy, and then Rocco, I think was the order. Uh, we were on at 1030, I believe. I could be wrong. Other people know this more than I do. But, um, but yeah, every Monday, every uh, Sunday morning was, was 
you know, the time to watch it. And that was the only time that it was on until, you know, years later when they started stripping the shows and putting them on at all hours, you know. But now, like, like Nickelodeon, I don't know how many times a week they air The Loud Family. Uh, you know, it goes pretty crazy. <laughs> you know, uh, so it's it's kind of different. It's 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 just well, it's, you know they're competing with different things. They're different. You know they're competing with the uh, people who can just sit down with their computers and watch whatever they feel like at any time, day or night. So, uh, and they feel it. They see it. It's it's. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know some of them are digging back into their into their libraries and seeing what they can pull out for new content. So, uh, Cartoon Network, you know, is bringing out the Powerpuff Girls again. You know, they, and Nickelodeon's got Hey Arnold and and uh, Rocco that were that were doing new specials, and you know, who knows what may come of that uh, series wise. So it's it's a new world. So I'm glad you brought that up because you know, as the announcement has been made, it's a television film one hour special that we're looking into right now. Yeah, actually, uh, we just finished up a record this morning. Uh, all the main guys were there, Charlie Adler and Tom Kenny and Carlos Salas Rocky and Doug Lawrence are all the main characters that are coming back and doing their roles. And uh, we had Linda Wallen, who does Dr. Hutchinson. And uh, it was, it's, it's been a blast, and it's also been a real mind-bender, you know, to... to get back in there. We're all gray and talking about our prostates and, you know, just <laughs> making cartoons, you know, it's kind of weird, but, uh, but it's fun. It's been, it's been really fun. Everybody has really been into it. And, and the story that we have and the board that we did, uh, we're really into and, and, uh, really feel like it's as strong, if not stronger than, than what we did originally. And that was really what I was going for. I, I told Nickelodeon I didn't want a watered down version of anything, and and uh, they've been really supportive. And so we we we're pushing some boundaries. That's awesome. With this. And yeah, yeah, we're we're pretty happy with that. So so you, you know we have a good project that people are rallying around, and and the network is supportive of it, and everybody working on it is is really into it. So. It's seen, obviously, as one of those things where, hey, you know, kids and teens of the 90s might watch it either with their kids or whatever age they are now that it's a generational thing. And the way I also see something like that was when Toy Story 3 came out, and that was, I believe, 11 years after. And it's like you target to the kids that are watching Disney right now and then those who grew up on the original Toy Story. And that's a huge benefit and it's like people always wonder how can i get this audience and that audience and then you know through promotion and people who are aware from watching it that's a great thing because you see like with the muppets and all that the revival it's the kids who see it on the tv with the commercials and then you know their parents and everyone all around it's win-win for everybody right yeah i mean we have a whole new audience of of like college age kids who grew up on it and uh, are getting jokes that they didn't get back then, you know? So it's like they, they're able to watch it in a whole new light and, and, you know, and then there's the, the older crowd that, that watched it, you know, with their kids. And, and I, and what's really been interesting is, and I think this is one of the reasons why Nickelodeon was starting to latch on to maybe this is something they want to do is, is that the, social media and, and, uh, you know, all around the web has been an incredible surge of stuff for Rocco. I mean, it's kind of shocked by how much, uh, is out there. And, uh, there's all these, you know, the, the Rocco's modern life site has well over a million people on it. And, and so it's really this fan support that can only be done in this web environment this you know that that can say you know we want something we want to see it again you know and and what's funny is that I would get emails every day about when are you going are you going to put to do any more Rocco and I would consistently say no way in hell we're going to do any more Rocco it's not going to happen 
<clears throat> because I mean, they were, Nickelodeon and I didn't exactly leave on a good note, and and uh, we've just been the farthest apart uh, in in our paths, and and uh, but I, I think it, it has been the the fans really um, keeping it alive that really opened up their eyes and said, you know, hey, maybe we have something we might want to revisit. So, yeah, so the call comes into me, and I'm just shocked out of my head that Nickelodeon's calling and asking if I'd be interested in in doing something. And, and uh, so I had I couldn't even uh, fathom it. I, I, I said I have to think about it. It's too weird. And <laughs> it was the farthest thing from my mind because I was also I've been working on a PBS show that I really like and we're about to go into main production we finished up the pilot and and PBS picked it up but um, but it's a totally different audience and, and I really love it but it, it it's it's talking to a different group of, of kids and so my head is in PBS land and suddenly Nickelodeon calls and wants me to do it in Morocco and you know, it was it was a a U turn. You know, literally. It's interesting when you know. First of all, I talk about the PBS transition, but before you were saying like, you know, you're looking to target equally as much to the generation who watched it and gets you know picks up on certain things. But I remember what would it have been like about 13 years ago that Ren and Stimpy reboot where, you know, instead of like keeping the wink and all that, it's just like they went, what I felt may have been too far. I get the idea, but you know, you take risks, you throw darts at the wall, see what sticks. And you know, the Powerpuff girls has been polarizing because some people, you know, criticize that they don't have the voice actors or the animation is too similar to other shows on there. Um, I remember like Rugrats when they did the did them as grown up and all that and that was just you know questionable to some people and it's just like you can't always wonder what if you got to give it a shot but it's only if you believe in it yourself when you're making it. Well, yeah, it's definitely not uh a slam dunk just because something was I mean, I could have, we could have messed it up just as easily as anything. And I was actually, I, I put a call in to Martin Olson and Doug Lawrence, who had worked on the original, and I said, you know, what do you think about trying this out? I, I don't know. We could, we could completely mess it up. I mean, those weren't the words I used. I used the F word, but we could really, you know, do a, a bad number on it if we don't do it right. And and I, I don't want to, you know, just have any any garbage out there that's just a reboot of something just because we, you know, we want to make a buck or they, they want to sell some more cereal, but you know, so we had to, so I, I actually wrote a story myself. Uh, and I said to myself that if they buy off on this story, then, um, then I'll do it. If not, I don't know if I want to do it because this is, this is a story I want to tell. And, and it kind of pokes, it, it's, it's, kind of poked some fun at Nickelodeon, actually, when they were able to, to, to laugh at themselves, which is, you give them a lot of credit. But, so I wrote the story, and I pitched it, and, and uh, they said, yeah, we like it. Yeah, let's, let's move forward. So, uh, so then when I felt, and then, we, when then Doug Lawrence and Martin Olsen and I wrote the, the story, you know, getting more in-depth into the story of what I had already written, we, we have a hook in there that, that, uh, really threw him for a loop, which is really funny. And, uh, and they bought off on it. So, uh, it's, it's, it is one of those things that sometimes they they work and sometimes they don't. It depends on who you got going for it. If they have a passion for the project. And yeah, I was really disappointed actually that they didn't bring Craig McCracken back to do, uh, Powerpuff, uh, reboot, but that, that's a, a complicated story. And, um, but I think it's hard, it's hard for, for, uh, for them to take something on that doesn't have a unified vision, uh, of something. And, you know, and there's also with this, with this project, we have a couple, we have some veterans working on it. And then we, we brought in some, some new guys who are really good, great talents, but they're also grew up on Rocco. So 
they've been kind of these uh, keepers of the flame and that we have to do it justice, mm-hmm. you know, because this is, this is to them, you know, like they were off like, drawing the TV. Oh, this is iconic. You know, <laughs> 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 like they had, they're in awe of every aspect of the show. And so they even tell me sometimes, you know, I don't know if this is right. You know, <laughs> if this, this is like, the way it's supposed to be. And we'll have a conversation about it. It's funny, but you know, so we do, we do the show justice, I, I think, and, and uh, everybody involved thinks so too. So we'll see, you know, if it, it could come out and everybody could say it sucks. I mean, that, that might happen, but uh, we're having fun doing it. Yeah, yeah. You never know until it happens, you know, because they always talk about sleeper, like the sleeper hit and maybe, with Nickelodeon, they were like, in the beginning, it's like, hey, we got to come out with this original content. And it's like, you know, it could be hit or miss, make or break the network. Because if I recall, they were shown like, you know, old Looney Tunes uh, shorts beforehand. And then just various shows here and there. And then this boom of the 90s. And it's like, all right, let's get next season rolling on all these shows. Right. Well, you know, the executives were... were uh very honest with us a lot of times saying, you know, the old Looney Tunes, we should get better ratings than your new episodes. <laughs> Which is, you know, well, okay, well, those guys had a lot of time to work on those. We don't have, you know, TV volume animation is a little different, but but not to make excuses, but they, you know, it's like, well, this old classic stuff, yeah, it really holds up. But, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's weird to to see how things progress and uh yeah it's uh it's it's a different world yeah it's just a matter of like you know taking these situations in the past 20 years and it's like okay how do we like have you just walked around and thought and saw or heard something it's like you know, I wish I could have applied that to Rocco or how you, thinking about how you'd fit it into the show, just something ridiculous or humorous that you saw or witnessed that you wish you could have? Uh, well, I didn't. I actually never thought about it until it was time to like write a story about it and, and uh, write a story for Rocco. And then, you know, the writers and I like, sat down and said, what has changed, you know, since the nineties, what is the, what is the new modern life? And, and, uh, then all these things just came flooding to us. And there's, there's a, there was enough material there to do three specials. I mean, we really, there's so much that we wanted to do in, in, uh, making a comment about life as we know it now and how Rocco adapts to it, you know, so it's, it, there's definitely uh, a, a lot to go from, you know, lots of, lots of, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot to say still, and, and it was very relevant. And it's like, how do you place them in the situation, each with their, you know, unique character traits? It's like, you know, what would the big heads be doing in their house? You know, like what design or setup or what would they be doing or maybe... You know, they got new jobs somewhere or, you know, you take their lifestyle from the original series and it's like, do you make adjustments or where are they now? Are they consistent? And it's a lot. It's interesting to think about. There's, there were many avenues we could have gone down. But, you know, Conglomo as a, as a company really lent itself to a lot of the corporate BS that's going on right now. And their their motto is "We still own you," <laughs> and uh, probably now more than ever. And uh, you know, so it really, uh, and Ed Bighead is is still working there. And uh, you know, you know, you'll have to see what the story where the story goes. But there was there was lots to do. They actually really fit in well their personalities into this new world and. Um, the Rocco, of course, is a little flabbergasted by the whole thing and trying to adapt to to it as easily as and uh yeah so we, all all the all the uh old favorites come back and uh, but it's interesting because we still had to 
you know, there, there's a lot there. We can't, we couldn't just assume that everybody knew all these aspects of the show because there's going to be some new viewers that, that watch Nickelodeon and, you know, they kept telling us there might be something, you know, maybe these kids don't understand. And so we had to keep some of those things in mind that there might be some fresh new eyes on this stuff. But yeah. And then those kids are going to be watching the original series because they're going to want to know, you know, the backstory of these characters. And then that's when the Netflix and the DVDs come in. And then, you know, it's a full right. circle. It's so much benefit right. for everybody involved. So uh, just a couple more things before we wrap up. I was actually curious about this. I want to get your take on it. What are you opinion on some interesting Rocco merchandise throughout the years? Because in my closet, I have that shirt with the four heads, I believe. It's Rocco, Heifer, Filber, and Spunky. So, like, throughout the years, have you seen anything either licensed or, you know, bootleg that really caused you to do a double take? <laughs> There's a lot of bootleg stuff out. It's just <laughs> crazy. And the guys on the crew are always coming in with a new bootleg T-shirt. They have uh, the Fatheads T-shirt. I think one time I bought one that says, I am the cheese from the <laughs> Wacky Deli episode. And, um, there's a lot of cool stuff, actually. I mean, it's, uh, uh, but I mean, it was funny when, when the show first came out, the, uh, the licensing department at Nickelodeon was new and they were like thinking, oh, we're, we're just going to blast this out there. And we had a Marvel comic and we had a calendar and we had some of the strangest stuff. I mean, the, things would come in and, you know, the show, didn't have the awareness when the first licensing stuff came out. So it didn't sell very well at first. And, um, but there were like these weird inflatable heifer hats and <laughs> it's just weird stuff. I still have some of it. I still have like boxes full of weird Rocco stuff. And, and, uh, but yeah, so it, what was interesting was, uh, this is kind of a little off the licensing topic, but um, they had they they were aiming for an audience that, well, at first they were like, we'll take any eyeballs we can get. And if, they'll, if they buy toys or whatever, you know, we don't care. If it's college students, that's fine, you know? So they they were really hands off on the things that I was doing with the show, and and so we were we were pulling in the highest household numbers uh, that they had, and which is one of the reasons why their licensing was was really going full bore at the beginning, but um, but then some new people came into their advertising department and said, you know, we should just aim our shows at six to elevens because that's where the advertising sweet spot is, and and. So they decided that they wanted to change my show to something like six to eleven, which is when I decided to stop making them. But <clears throat> all the toys were going out to like this this a more adult audience. And if you if you see any of the Ren and Stimpy stuff too, there was some really like the scratch and sniff book that they had out and. There's some there's some really cool stuff, and they, they you know it wasn't uh, you know just aimed at at young kids, and and uh, so nowadays, yeah, I think the biggest I mean we've got flash drives, we've got uh, uh, lots of t-shirts, and it's starting to expand again. They're doing some plushes. There's a spunky plush that just came out, but we'll see if this special like has anything new coming out licensing wise well i know the hype's going to be all over the place and like you know it's going to blow up on social media that's a huge advantage right now that it's not just hey catch the commercial when you can like a mr plow kind of thing with uh simpsons but it's like you know just social media log on to facebook and not just the posts but they have those uh like the trending now and then it'll say you know rocco announced for this date or this trailer commercial came out so there's so much benefit right now to it. Are we in fact leaving off um, or leaving off from the last episode was the Thanksgiving special? Uh, 
the Thanksgiving special actually aired before the last episode that officially we had we had them uh, flying off into space. The last episode it wasn't Thanksgiving. That's what's listed, I think, on Wikipedia or whatever or IMDb. But it, the last episode, it's kind of funny because I always said because the, sometimes the, the writers would pitch to me and say, "Can we send Rocco into space?" And, and I would say, "If if we ever send Rocco into space, it means the show's over." <laughs> and so, of course, of course, the last episode. Uh, we knew it was our last episode, and so we sent them off into space. So, I mean, I'm not supposed to talk too much about the plot line of the special, but the spoiler alert is that they come back from being out in space for 20 years. And <laughs> that's where they come back to <laughs> O-Town, O-Town 20 years later, and uh, which is the starting point. I won't tell the rest of the story, but uh, it worked It worked out really well. They've been out floating around space for 20 years, and... Uh, now they're back. That's going to be they're a trip. Back. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm so stoked for it, and you know so many people are, and looking forward to big things. Before we wrap up, can we get some uh, websites, plugs, any particular projects outside of Rocco or anything you want to get out there at the moment? Yeah, I don't know. My PBS special, I mean, my PBS series is not really in your, uh, in your age demographic. Um <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, if you have a preschool audience, uh, look out for Luna Around the World. It's going to be on PBS uh, next year, early 2018. Uh, I have my book, Creating Animated Cartoons with Character, which you can get from my website, Signed, but it's also available uh, from Amazon. And uh, joemurraystudio.com. You can see my blog and see the progress on the special. I've been posting stuff about all, all of the uh, little antidotes about making the special. And, uh, yeah, that's about all I have to plug. That's awesome. That's very interesting. <laughs> oh, I beg to differ, and I'm definitely going to keep track of the uh, going to keep track of the blog. And, you know, for any updates, I will definitely keep eyes and ears open at all times, sleeping with one eye open. So Great. I would love to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure, and... You know, it's not the end. It's just the beginning right now. We're going <laughs> to see what happens. I'm stoked. Yeah. Well, after after the special comes out, I'll be happy to join you again if you want to talk about it. I'd like oh, to hear your, for your sure. uh, opinion of it. Oh, definitely. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. There you have it. Big things ahead. Joe Murray, Rocco's Modern Life. Head on over to joemurraystudio.com to keep updated for when the television special will be airing. Don't forget to make your way over to journeyofafrontman.com where you can see all the past, present, and future along with all the social media there as well. Subscribe, leave a comment and rating over on iTunes. And that about does it this week. My name is Alex Obert. This is Journey of a Frontman. And as you know by now, thank you once again for joining me on the journey.